Hello and good morning, Asia. Um, as you all may already know, open banking has been spreading like wildfire around the world. Uh, different countries and regions are adopting open banking for various reasons. Some for uh, providing better uh, services and customer experiences to the banking consumers, some to break up the banking monopoly and to allow better access to new entrants into the market. Some to optimize the payments, some for financial inclusion, and the list goes on. So um, when we look at open banking for Asia, there are some very unique reasons why Asia should adopt open banking. And today I'm going to discuss uh, some of the unique challenges Asian banking industry is facing and how we should craft our open banking strategy to overcome those challenges. So a first look at financial inclusion in Asia. Um, at first glance, it might seem that um, the financial inclusion number for Asia is not that bad. 74% of adults have a bank account. But if you look closely into this data, you will see that only 34% saved the financial institution in the last year, and only 20% borrowed from a bank. And what's worse is that only 20% of the workforce received wages into a banking account. These stats are for East Asia and the Pacific, excluding developed countries. So what this means is that the Asian population, or the majority of the Asian population, is not benefiting from the security and the facilities of maintaining their financial position at a bank. And on the other hand, the banks themselves don't seem to have penetrated the market very well. While this is a challenge, it is also a large opportunity for banks that they are in such an untapped market that is ready to be penetrated. So when crafting an open banking strategy in this region, financial inclusion could definitely be one of the key motivations. All right, let's take a look at the bank, the banking consumers of today. I found this really clever infographic by Barclays, which categorizes the different generations that we have today in terms of when they were born, but also in terms of their behavior. Now, um, I, I'm sure most of you are mapping yourselves into these boxes, and I'm sure most of you are mapping yourself into the boxes on the right. Um, if you look at these different categories, you will see that over the years, especially anyone born after 1960, uh, are basically digital first generations. They are either digital immigrants, digital natives, or technoholics. They prefer digital experiences over the traditional ones. Now, it seems like it's a, it's a 40% to 60% split between these generations, but if we really map it out uh, in terms of the population growth and the aging of these populations, you will see that a large majority, 84%, belongs to the digital first generation. And that's today. In another 10 years, this is going to be even further skewed. So the banking consumer that we are really catering to today demands digital experiences. <coughs> so what are these digital requirements? I like to talk about it in four different areas. The first being better access. Access to banking can generally be a whole lot better. Um, the ability to do most, if not all, of the banking using a single mobile device. Uh, the ability to access information as well as payments using hassle-free identification methods, such as biometrics. 
uh, and also the ability to access all banking information and all financial information spread across different financial institutions from one place is essential. Then we look at relevance and how customized these services are for banking consumers. Um, currently, if you want a banking product, let's say um, a housing loan, most banks provide general information on their uh, portal. Customers who need something more specific that does not fit into the general template have to either visit the bank or speak to an agent. They don't have the necessary tools. The banks do not provide the necessary tools for the customers to customize uh, these products themselves. So customers in the digital age expect that capability. The ability to create quotations, for example, simulate payments, uh, and basically subscribe to services online, monitor and manage existing accounts digitally, etc. And even notifications and messaging should be, a, should be customizable by the consumer himself. So that the consumer will give due regard to the messages that are relevant to him and act on them, as opposed to ignoring everything. Then we look at technology-driven services. Today, technology decides everything for us. Uh, where we go on holiday, what we eat, what's the best route to take to go to work. Um, and we want our banking to also benefit from this or use this technology to provide that type of service where we don't feel that we have to do, go an extra mile just to get our banking done. Uh, for example, the bank is not providing a personal finance management tool for these digital first customers, then they're just going to move away. Uh, a, a personal finance management tool, for example, should enable saving stores, uh, payment simulators, or saving simulators, uh, the ability to integrate with external fintechs, all based on a customer's specific spending patterns and earning capability. And uh, apart from that, the ability to uh, withdraw cash without cards, peer to peer payments, uh, these are just notions that these digital customers expect to be there uh, without having to uh, figure out how to do it themselves. And lastly, a note about lifestyle management. Consumers expect their banks to enable them to manage their lifestyles. No one wakes up in the morning and thinks, oh, I want to do my banking today. Rather, people wake up dreaming about their uh, holiday, dreaming about educating their children, dreaming about uh, their next promotion. So banking really needs to understand these different lifestyle elements and help consumers achieve those dreams without them feeling that they need to come to a different place to do their banking. So these are just some examples of some of those digital first experiences that these digital generations are demanding. Now, if we take a look at the different channels that banks have been providing to their customers over the years. I think this picture um, grabs all the different uh, types of channels that banks have for their customers. And we have evolved uh, over time from channel to channel, so much so that right now, many of us use a combination of these channels to do our bank. Now, <coughs> What happens when consumers bank with multiple banks is that this number of channels increase exponentially and then it becomes a nightmare to handle or manage all these different channels from these different providers. It means multiple different interactions via different mechanisms, leaving the consumer incapable of consolidating his financial picture 
in enjoying any of the digital experiences that we mentioned before. But open banking, in an open banking world, banks expose their products and services via APIs. That's the last channel. So that third parties can consume them with the customer's consent in order to better provide services to the customer. And these services include the very same requirements uh, of the digital consumer of today. And customers select an experience through a third party application that really caters to their needs and then access all his bank accounts from that one place. It provides a single access point and it also enables creating tailor-made products and services by organizations who specialize in that, that are the third party. And it also allows the bank to focus on their core competency, which is creating great banking, uh, financial products and services. In this ecosystem, the customer is happy because the customer has access to everything in one place and the customer controls all of that by providing the consent uh, on what the bank can share with the third party. All right. Now, open banking seems to be making the customer very happy. But uh, is that all? Banks um, would want to understand what is in it for banks beyond customer satisfaction. And there are a lot of advantages for banks as well. And I'm going to talk about some of them. First, open banking expands the distribution channel of financial products and services. Now, historically, uh, banking has been a direct distribution network where banks provide or create financial products and they distribute it to their customers directly. So what happens when you do that is that your distribution or your penetration of the market is as good as your channels that take you to that market. It is usually um, practically impossible for you to have a channel that caters to the full population. Imagine a mobile application that, that is perfect for Generation Z as well as the maturists or the baby boomers. That's literally impossible, right? So what happens is, as a result of the capabilities of the channels that take the products to the consumers, banks then end up having a subset of the population rather than the full consumer base. Open banking changes this by allowing third parties to access a bank's products and services via the APIs and takes it to larger user groups because there are third parties that cater to different types of user groups in the market. And the more third parties that you onboard, the more user groups that you can penetrate. And it's great for the consumer as well because now the consumer also has more access to different types of banks that we didn't have access to before. So that's distribution channel. Another thing is the ability to know your customer like never before. Now historically, knowing your customer is limited to the information that the customer provides the bank and the additional information or the data that the bank creates themselves regarding the customer based on financial position maintained at the bank. But as we know, consumers usually bank with more than one bank. And depending on his consolidated financial picture, the view that the bank has about the customer may not be very accurate. And that is a hindrance in providing a tailor-made service to the consumer if the bank does not understand the consumer's full financial picture. But the open banking ecosystem changes that. It allows the third parties to gather the full financial picture and creates a consolidated financial uh, data set for the consumer at the level of the third party. 
how banks can benefit from that is to expand and extend their open banking implementations, not just to expose API, but to act as third parties and consume APIs, consume data from other financial institutions on behalf of the customer. That way, the bank now understands the customer beyond the confines of the bank and is able to really make <coughs> fully custom, tailor-made products and services and offers for the customer. We can see a lot of banks, especially in Europe, uh, taking on this additional responsibility of acting as a third party after they have completed their open banking compliance. And then, of course, a real benefit is that open banking acts as a stepping stone into digital banking. <coughs> um, if we look at digital banking, um, I think I, I went one slide too far ahead. But let's take a step back and try to understand what, what is expected by a digital bank. For customers, they expect everything that they had to do physically at a bank now to be available digitally. And they expect those digital experiences uh, that we spoke about before. Now, in order to provide that, the bank's technology has to go under a complete overhaul so that the bank's technology is fully connected, the different systems are fully connected, um, identity is managed, analytics are done as a whole, and this digital experience can be provided. But what we see more, that, more often than not, even in, largest, in, in some of the largest banks in existence today, unfortunately, are spaghetti architectures, uh, multiple identities that customers and employees have to maintain in order to access different systems. And as a result, siloed analytics, because data and the analytics done on top of that is limited to the different systems uh, that are now not really interconnected. Now, how is open banking going to solve all this? Let's take a step back and look at the different technology components that are required for open banking to um, be successful. Open banking requires API management, obviously, to expose the APIs, to manage them, to secure them, to provide developer portals for third parties to onboard, etc. It also requires identity and access management to authenticate consumers, to manage their consent, etc. It also requires analytics to uh, identify what's happening, to look at the data of, of this open banking channel, and to create business insights. And importantly, it also needs integration capability to integrate all of these components into the bank's core banking systems. Right, now, <coughs> we go back to the bank's infrastructure and we apply these components to the full tech stack of the bank and we realize the real bonus of open banking. It provides a technology component that the bank should invest in in order to be open banking compliant. Those components are the very building block of the bank's digital transformation. It provides a better integration of the myriad technology platforms at the bank. Uh, the ability to expose functionality as APIs for both internal and external usage. The unification of identity and access management where a bank's employees as well as customers may use a single identity to access all applications and portals. And the really good use of analytics on the data collected by different applications that enable the bank to um, gain business intelligence to act as a digital bank. So there are many uh, benefits and there are many reasons that banks are adopting open banking. Now, a final word about WSO2 and open banking. Uh, WSO2 is involved in 
open banking technology projects all over the world, not just with banks, but we also provide technology to uh, open banking regulators in terms of regulatory sandboxes, reference implementations, etc. We are also part of uh, various technical standards committees and advisory committees uh, of these technical standards bodies that um, are there to guide open banking implementations. If you look at WS2 open banking solution, uh, which will be uh, discussed <coughs> in detail in the WS2 workshop that happens after this, um, it has all the requirements that are required for a successful open banking implementation. We have API templates that support uh, all of the popular open banking standards out there, and we continue to add uh, upcoming uh, standards. We have built in API security, uh, strong customer authentication, uh, adaptive authentication, and user consent management that is required. Uh, to manage this, uh, the security of open banking transactions, uh, fraud detection and transaction risk analysis, which uh, elevates that security and uh, provides better customer experiences through uh, adaptive authentication, etc., based on uh, transaction risk analysis. And on the other hand, we have the analytics and business insights integration point so that we can quickly connect the uh, open banking uh, components to the banks existing. Um, technology. The solution is GDPR compliant and it's built on top of the WS2 platform so that it can be extended for usages beyond just open banking. And the real advantage of WS2 for open banking is that we have a large group of um, engineers at WS2 who are focused on open banking, who are part of these uh, different um, technical standards bodies, etc. So you're working with regulatory and domain experts on your open banking projects. Uh, our technology implementations are much shorter because we've already set up, we've done all of the work, we've all done all of the pre-configurations, and all that needs to be done is to integrate these uh, open banking components into the bank's infrastructure. Uh, the solution comes in a componentized architecture. As you saw before, there are different components. And each of these components can be mixed and matched uh, with whatever technology that the bank currently has, if they can be reused for open banking requirements. And the solution is extensible to uh, other digital trans uh, transformation projects, and therefore it doesn't stop at providing just open banking. So this is all I have. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Sushika. Thank you. Big round of applause, guys. Sushika. Sushika, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yes. All right, perfect. Any questions? So far, no? Okay, I've got one question for you. It sure. seems like there's a lot of uh, competition between uh, uh, service providers in banks or anybody can run the APIs. That's the fact that, okay, I've got 50 APIs, no, I've got 100 APIs, about 150 APIs. There's a lot of competition now in the banking yet. But how do you really measure success of open banking, for example? It's not the amount of APIs that measures success. How would you, what would, what would be your process? Um, I, I, I'm sorry, um, I think your question is kind of, um, it was breaking a bit. Uh, I heard you mention that, um, you know, numbers of APIs, um, and then you said something about how do you um, ensure success. Could you, could you just bridge the two? Because I think I missed the middle part. What will be your top three uh, reasons for measuring success of, of open banking? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's very clear. Uh, <laughs> I think, um, yes. There are lots and lots of APIs, um, but I think the, the way you measure success is not by uh, the number of APIs uh, that you have, but rather by some other things. One, the first is how many third parties are onboarding your, uh, uh, your platform, 
your open banking uh, developer portal? How friendly is it? And how, uh, how many third parties are on board? Secondly, uh, how, many of your API, how, how is the traffic that is coming to your APIs? How many of your APIs are actually used uh, through these third party applications? Uh, and thirdly, is your customer base growing? Um, <coughs> if your customer base is not growing and your customer base is flat, uh, after many months of uh, your open banking platform being alive, then there is something, some sort of innovation that you need to do uh, in, order to, um, in order to cater to these customers that, that, that are currently not in your consumer base, but you want them to be. And these things are interconnected. If third parties are not onboarding, uh, or if, if your um, developer portal is used by limited numbers of third parties, that means obviously your customer base is not going to grow because that's really the distribution world. So it's all about giving some love to your third parties, ensuring they're happy. Uh, and it's also making your APIs relevant and easily accessible and continue. benefiting from the ecosystem. Amazing, thank you very much. Yes, question here. Hi, my name is Michelle, I'm from Operatives. My question is, like, what were the challenges uh, that you faced in convincing the bank to share these kind of sensitive data for these uh, APIs for enabling open banking? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, could you repeat that question? What were the challenges of? Okay, so my question was, what are the challenges in convincing the banks so that they can share with these kind of sensitive data to these uh, API, third party API? Why would the bank share the data of the customer to, the, uh, to these APIs? What are the challenges of banks exposing sensitive data through these APIs? That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, very good question. So, um, Actually, the open banking ecosystem is created in a way that uh, those challenges are minimized. Now, um, if I take you to this slide, uh, what typically happens is that um, when a customer uh, wants to access their data through a third party application, what happens is that the customer comes to the third party application and request to uh, see their data from bank A. Now, if the third party application wants to access uh, data from bank A for the customer, the customer has to first provide an instruction to bank A to share the data with the third party application. So what happens is the third party application will uh, request for this access and then we will redirect the customer to the bank's authentication page so that the customer authenticates directly with the bank. Because for the bank, this request is coming from a third party and he can't act without direct uh, instructions for the consumer. So that's where the strong customer authentication happens. And usually, uh, that request, uh, we do multi-factor authentication in order to really ensure that this is the actual customer behind this request. And after he has been authenticated, there's a further step where the customer has to provide um, fine-grained consent for that transaction. So the customer says, please make available this data set, this limited data set, to this particular third party for this period of time. And the bank has to store that consent and then make that data available to the customer. And in making the data available to the customer, because it is going via an API, we can now enable all the API security like uh, OAuth 2 or certificate validation, you know, and, and then we encrypt that channel so that the data is transmitted in the most secure format. Now, earlier this was not the case because third parties were screen scraping and using the consumer's uh, actual credentials to log into these portals and scrape that data. So open banking has actually really enhanced the security of sensitive data transfer 
uh, by introducing the concepts of uh, strong customer authentication and uh, consent management. And customers can always revoke that consent. Uh, that is part and parcel of uh, the open banking 